Our text today is from chapter 17 of the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The book of Judges covers a period of 400 years of Bible history. It spans that four centuries from Israel's entry into the land of Canaan to the days of Samuel and the first kings of, of the people. But it is a stormy and chaotic chapter in the history of the people of God. And this one reoccurring line tells it all. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. What's wrong with that, you ask? There was no king. Kings can be trouble. Kings can be tyrants and despots and dictators, exploiting oppressing and enslaving a people. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. No laws, no rules. That's liberty, isn't it? Perfect freedom for you and every last one of you can do that which is right in his own eyes. Please, people, read the resurrection. Stand these pages and see what happens to a people when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Note on these pages the ruin and the shame, the disorganization and disintegration of such a people. The shocking scenes of brutality and bloodshed, of unspeakable savagery and sexual perversion. Picture what would happen to your home, your family, your marriage, if everybody in it does just what is right in his own eyes. Read your daily newspaper, why don't you? When more and more of people live without rules, without restraints, without responsibility, each indulging his own whims and passions of the moment, without self-control, without self-discipline, each man doing the thing that's right in his own eyes. It wasn't all bad. From time to time and in different places, the Lord raised up judges, deliverers, to come to the aid of his people. They were men and women of outstanding courage and daring, and you know their story. In the north, there was the torch woman, Deborah who with her army, such as it was, stemmed the tide of the Assyrian aggressors. But even Deborah wondered, what kind of wimps have the men become if they're going to let a woman do their fighting for them? And why so many of the men he nodded all to hear the trumpet call to battle. And she said so. There was Gideon and his heroic band of 300 who drove the sons of the desert back across the river into the wilderness. Only to find that the other Israelite tribes were jealous of him and hated him. For his heroism, 
And as soon as he died, they murdered every member of his family. Except for one. And across Jordan, Jephthah and his mountain men came down to deal the Ammonites a defeat. Only to turn around and find that he was attacked by the rival tribes of his own people, of Israel. Finally, in the south, the siege was sent to Samson against the Philistines. And by this time, the people had sunk so far that they betrayed their own champion into the hands of the Philistine enemy. With Samson's death, the last of the judges appears on these pages. But the book of Judges does not end yet. There are two more stories. They are shameful, squalid stories about shameful, squalid people. One tells about the spiritual decay of the rank and file. The other about the moral collapse. They are stories of cowardice and idolatry and sodomy and rape and wholesale slaughter. Like you read in the daily newspaper, you know. But these stories impress upon us as nothing else could. What happens when every man does that which is right in his own eyes? Our text carries us away to the hill country of Ephraim, to the home of the man Micah, who lives in the central highlands of Palestine. Micah has stolen a sum of money from his mother. An enormous amount, some 1,100 pieces of silver. Was the old woman suspicious? She stormed around the place, swearing, calling down curses upon the culprit. She said, here, I had vowed that entire amount of money to bring a blessing. Upon my son. She did not say that when she had the money. She said that after it was gone. Well, Micah has a change of heart. Says to his mother, I did it. And she has a change of heart. Stops cursing and says, A oh, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And then she forgets about her vow, takes 200 of the silver shekels, pays them to a silversmith, makes for her graven idols and images. But why should it surprise me that such a mother has such a son. Micah puts all of the religious furniture into his house and makes a shrine in his own home. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? For it's what every home should have, a shrine, a family altar where the members can have devotion together and pray together, and praise God together. What's wrong with it is? Nothing. According to my test, all right in his eyes. But is it in God? You see, he wants a religion on his own terms. By what's right in his own eyes, and not the Lord. 
Few people remember the very first of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters of the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. They all knew that. How could they forget it? It was the last thing that Moses had told them. It was the final word of the old soldier Joshua in his farewell address. The impulse to idolatry and the weather, these images were in the form of the golden bull calf of Egypt, the fathers had once done. Whether they were in the shape of some phallic or fertility symbol of the Canaanite nation, what difference does it make? The sanctuary of the Lord was in Shiloh. There was the appointed priesthood of the house of Aaron. There was the altar of sacrifice. There the blood of the Lamb. There the place of confession and forgiveness of sin and grace of peace and pardon. All of that was a perfect picture and a prophecy of the coming Messiah, of the Lamb of God, of whose shed blood alone the sin of the world would be cleansed away. But if they ever distorted that picture, if they blurred and messed up the design, if they mingled other religions with the religion of the Lord, then they would never recognize the Christ when he came. And that's pretty much what happened. The impulse to idolatry is strong in every age. Ours included to take of the invisible, the spiritual, and the eternal and try to embody it in something physical and tangible and temporal. You see, if we make of our religion big building, budget, business, outward programs and organizations of every conceivable kind. We tie our hearts to a system, to a synod, to a party that impresses you because you can see it with your eyes. And it's good in your own eyes. Whereas Christ says, the kingdom of God. No, not the one you're talking about. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. And neither shall they say, Oh, there it is! Or, oh, I, there it is! And why not? Because the kingdom of God is within you, said Christ. It is a thing of the spirit of the faith and of your heart, and nothing can ever change that. It's all so big, the woman at the well once said. The eternal is so invisible, nobody knows what's right and what's wrong, she said. Jesus told her, salvation is of the Jews. God is a spirit, and all they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Don't take what is of your faith in spirit, 
make it into some image of your own mold. Micah must have sensed some of this. Maybe his boy, whom he appointed to be priest, was fumbling through the ceremony of reading, stumbling through the ritual. Anyway, Jesus should come traveling through the place. But a Levite, one of the religious teachers of Israel, this Levite hailed from the village of Bethlehem. And it appears that he was not satisfied with that obscure village and outpost of duty. He was looking for something bigger and better. And Micah makes a deal with him. Dwell with me, he said. And be unto me a father and a priest. And I will give thee ten silver shekels every year and your clothing and food included. It was just what the Levite was looking for. And why not? People will tell you they see nothing wrong in their own eyes if you use the church to advance yourself. For financial profit, for social preferment, for job security. Never mind that he's in the wrong profession, in the wrong place, and for the wrong motive. Perfectly all right in his eyes. And at the end of the chapter, we see Micah standing there over all that he has and says, Now I know that the Lord will do me good, being I have this Levite to my priest. But that is not the last picture you're going to have of the man Micah. But you can understand how he did it. He set up a church in his own house. was convenient, to say the least. Relatively inexpensive. Cozy. Comfortable. A priest is a personal friend. And all the power of the shrine at your back and call. And it was convenient for his neighbors in the area as well. That's exactly what the money changers in the temple of Jesus day said. We are only offering the people a convenience, a public service to make things easier for them. That's exactly what the Pharisees said, who dedicated to God all of their possessions. See? Then they didn't have to take care of their aged parents. Chuck, all my property belongs to God, and you wouldn't want me to buy false teeth for grants. With God's money, would you? Isn't that clever? And that's what the monks said in the Middle Ages. As they crept behind their monastery walls to a superior calling in their own eyes and trampling down as inferior what God had given. Wife, children, home, and the honest labor of a man's hand. Everything that is truth in the Christian religion involves the principle of sacrifice. Christ died many times along the way before he laid down his life for us on Calvary. And whether that kind of salvation is right in the world's eyes or not, ours is another faith and prayer. 
My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. Amen.